Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, host of the Football History Dude podcast, right here on the Sports History Network. Now, before we jump into another sports history adventure, let me tell you about this episode's sponsor. We partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get deals on over 30,000 autograph sports collectibles. They even have film, music, and other entertainment autographs on the site, so there's something for everyone. Perhaps you're looking for a gift for Mother's Day, or maybe Father's Day. Heck, who needs a holiday as an excuse to give a piece of sports history to your loved ones? Or how about yourself? Today seems like a great day to add to your sports cave, right? But how was RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes, so there are no extra markups, and they choose to pass these savings on to the customer. All orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and money-back guarantee. And to make sure RSA knows that the Sports History Network sent you, we created a special link for you. All you have to do is head to shop rsa.com forward slash shn again that's shop rsa.com forward slash shn head over there to get your piece of sports history today this podcast is part of the sports history network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport you can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com Hello, Old Sports, and welcome to another episode of the Hello, Old Sports podcast here on the Sports History Network. I'd like to thank you for joining us as always, and uh, this is a very special treat for us today. We have with us uh, author and uh, journalist, uh, former CNN uh, editor-at-large, Chris Saliza, and he has written the book of Power Players, Sports, Politics, and the American presidency. And uh, Mr. Saliza, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us here today. Other than calling me Mr. Saliza, great opening. You can just <laughs> call me, you can just call me Chris. <laughs> and, and before we start, I just should note that um, my wife will uh, will be angry if re- with me if I don't mention right off the bat what a big fan she is as a okay daily or maybe somewhat semi, you know, three or four days a week listener to the Tony Kornheiser podcast. So um, she's we like big, to hear she's Good. a big she's a loyal little. She, exactly. Exactly. She's a loyal little. Um, And I, I'm, I'm a I'm a less frequent listener, but I I've been a fan of Tony Kornheiser going back to his sports reporter he's days the in the mid 90s. So, yeah, people always ask me what he's like. And I'm like, exactly how you think he is <laughs> grouchy. Yes. Grouchy. Yeah. He's not playing a part. He's being himself. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we really kind of jumped at the opportunity to do this this cool. interview because if this actually we started our podcast in late um, late 2020 and every year on President's Day I thought that this might be a good topic to sort of talk about presidents and sports mm-hmm. and we've kind of touched on various things whether it was um, Trump with the USFL whether it was uh, Bush yeah. 41 as the captain of the Yale baseball team and meeting yeah. Babe Ruth or Bush, uh, you know, almost becoming MLB commissioner. But why don't you tell us a little bit about the book and then also kind of what made you want to write it? Well, I mean, you outlined in some ways why there's just so many good stories around presidents and sports and a bunch have been told in disparate places. You know, uh, there's been books written. Don Van Atta wrote a, a great book about golf and the presidents. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been a few academic, more academic uh, research books written about it, but there hasn't been sort of a popular. And by that, mean I just mean like a, you know, for, for a general audience book that says, here's here's the presidents, here's the sports they played, loved and watched. Here's what it tells us about them. So to be honest, I was like a little bit surprised that the book was like not something that people had done before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we obviously the first one of the first things you do when you do this is you look around and say, has has someone written a book that's really similar to this in the last two or three years? So uh, it's just my attempt to I've always cared about two things, sports and politics. And it was always I, I was always trying to figure out a way to get those two things to talk to one another in a way that seems smart and thoughtful. It took me a long time to, to think of uh, sort of how we could do that. But this book is that um, is that attempt, I think. 
And for the listeners, I just want to note that uh, while I did not note at the beginning, Andrew is in fact with us. He's just joining us. So, Andrew, uh, thanks for thanks for joining. Yes, I'm joining from my mobile office outside my job. So <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. It's the best place. <laughs> so I think um, there, there's there's so many different places that we can take this. And there's so many kind of cool, whether they're anecdotes or or bigger picture things that I want to um, get out from the book. But you there's really kind of two categories, and that's maybe a little bit of an oversimplification. But you talk about these guys, um, and you started with Eisenhower, and you're up through Biden. So mm-hmm. by my by my quick math, I think that's 13. I could be could be wrong. Good job by you. I think that's right, but I'm, <laughs> I don't want to confirm it. <laughs> so sort of two questions, and this is a little bit from left field, but of of the 13 presidents that you looked at, who would you consider sort of the best athlete, and then who would you think of as maybe the biggest fan, just the fan yes. of sports? So um, I think without question, the best like pure athlete is Gerald Ford, which I don't Mm -hmm. think should surprise people who listen to your podcast, who pay attention to this stuff, right? Gerald Ford was on like a real division one football team at the university of Michigan. He was a starting offensive lineman. He had uh, contracts to play uh, for the lions and the bears post uh, his time in college. He ultimately didn't do that and went to law school, but like, no one else has that pedigree, right? There's there's no other president that you can point to and say, like, this is a person who had offers to play presidentially. Like, it's not a thing. Um, I would put – so that's – so Ford is clearly, like, one, number one overall. 1A, I would put George H.W. Bush. And I think that George H.W. Bush is good at a lot of things. Um, obviously, he is the captain of the Yale baseball team. He plays first base. He's not a great hitter. He's a pretty good fielder. He, he never has any aspirations, nor does he have any offers to play professionally, although he did. This made me happy. So I remember, I'm 47, so I remember when All-Star Weekend at, in Major League Baseball used to be, um, they would have an old-timers game in addition to having the All-Star game. So, you know, you'd get like guys who were like 50, 60, maybe a 70-year-old or two out there and they'd play. Well, when Bush was vice president, I think it was 80 three he played in the old timers game in houston and actually got a hit and made like a very slick play in the field which is a little odd given that he was not at that level of like a baseball player he, yeah. he's not like a, he's not like a oh if he had gone in another direction he would have been orlando cepeda you know what i mean like he's <laughs> not he's, he's just not that good he's um, not what ford was for football in other words not even close no not even close and and like would, you know their question like would ford be a starting offensive lineman on the michigan football team today no right i mean no he would not be almost certainly but he was at the time in his moment he was an elite athlete. so i would say one and one a are ford and then bush clearly in that order though um the uh what was your other one? Because I had someone specific for it, and I want to make sure I get it right. What was the other one that I wanted that you wanted me to pick? Who would you consider the biggest fan? Just you know, uh, like, yes, like we totally. are, just like the teams, totally. you know, professional college, whatever. But just going to the Easy. games, watching them, whatever. Easy, Nixon. He was I like thought a so. He was like a maniacal fan, uh, particularly of baseball. Um, he was. Uh, Nixon is like, uh, in some ways, he kind of reminds me of myself. In some ways, like he. He played sports growing up, but like he wasn't particularly gifted at them. You know, he loved them more than he was good at them. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So he plays football in high school. He even plays football in college. But like, there's the great, there's these great, maybe not great for Nixon, but there's these great anecdotes. Basically, like Nixon is essentially like a tackling dummy in college. Like he's just cannon fodder. He's just mm-hmm. out there to get knocked over because they have to run plays against the against the uh, practice squad, and he's on the practice squad. Um, but he is a he is a literally a maniacal fan. So there's this one great anecdote. It's I think it's in '69. Some a reporter for the AP asks him randomly, asks him like, "Who are your who 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 are the four best players ever?" So, something like that. You know, some like very open ended question. And Nixon gets like super into it. Um, and with David Eisenhower, who yet is is Dwight Eisenhower's grandson and also married to uh, Nixon's daughter, mm-hmm. with David Eisenhower, they like retreat to Camp David, and Nixon comes up with four teams: American League and National League. And he basically does like 1880 to 1930 
as one bracket. And then 1932, at that point, the present, so, you know, 70, 69, 70, as another bracket. And he, he doesn't just do, like, uh, a starting nine. He does, like, relief pitchers, <laughs> left-handed relief pitcher specialists. Like, it's the nerviest list of all time. And like and 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 like way more than the, the AP reporter asked for. Like the AP reporter was like, oh, I'll ask Nixon like who his favorite baseball player is. That might be interesting. And Nixon goes like way, way overboard and goes into all this stuff because he is like a huge fan. You if you listen to some of the Nixon tapes um th- during Watergate, you can hear baseball back on in the background. Like he he is a guy who is really, really into sports, not just baseball, but I think his mind, the sort of there, what you find is there's a lot of crossover. I'm sure you guys have found this. There's 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 a big concentric circle between people who are nerdy about politics and people who are nerdy about baseball. Like of all the yeah. sports that people who are nerdy about politics like, mm-hmm. baseball is the one that they gravitate toward the most, even though it's like clearly like probably the third major sport in this country at this point. Um, I guess you could debate it with basketball, but but regardless, like it's it's a it, there's a there's a huge overlap, and Nixon is very much in that. So he's definitely he he and Pat when they were dating would go to uh, uh, football games, and Nixon would be like screaming and like frothing at the mouth. Like he's he is like a real he's a I think I say in the book he's a fan bordering on fanatic, you know, in the in the traditional definition of it. Yeah, I've heard a tape, one of his tapes that was released um, where he's talking to his daughter in the Oval Office, and I think it's a Cowboy Redskin game late in the season, and he's rooting for Washington, but somebody's coming back, and he's like, he's all of a sudden in the middle of talking to his daughter, he's yelling, dig, dig, God damn it!" and so he yeah. really was, he was <laughs> oh, yeah. a sports fan in a way that some of the others really weren't. And he's, 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 he's also like a frustrated athlete, too, you know what I mean? Like, he's not, unlike a Ford or a Bush, or even the younger Bush, all of whom were, they're not, the, the two Bushes are not elite athletes, but they're quite good athletes. Like George Bush is good at things he tries to do. Like he's a, he's a good long distance runner. He can bike for a long time. He's a pretty good baseball player. Even I put Donald Trump. Donald Trump's a pretty good baseball player. He's a good golfer. That is not the story of Richard Nixon. Like mm-hmm. he, he is, he is a guy who loves sports, but is not good at them. Um, and I think channels all of his love for them into sort of this maniacal devotion to stats and numbers and history, which, which by the way, I totally can relate to because like, I feel like I spent, you know, most of my twenties, like managing fantasy baseball teams, mm-hmm. you know, like Nixon, yeah. Nixon would be a great fantasy baseball manager. If, if like that existed now, you know, <laughs> if it existed back then, like he'd be good at that. He was really into all that stuff. And, and, and it was real. It was not like a, some of these guys, one of the things you find if you did, did when I did the book, some of these guys is sports is just a put on. They know it's a common language that the public speaks. They know they have to be at least like semi conversant in it. And so they are. Lyndon Johnson's a good example of that. Like for Nixon, it's real. Like Nixon genuinely cares in a way that most of them did. Yeah. It's, to me, the, the anecdote about the all time teams, A, is the one I most identify with because you know, we do <laughs> totally. a podcast on this. But it's also especially sort of interesting because the people in the orbit that are mentioned in the in your anecdote about that, it's a lot of the same names as the Watergate people. So like these people, yes. you on, the people you only usually hear about Colson in, you know, Hold all the president's in. men. Yep. And here he's he's bringing him numbers on Walter Johnson. So it's a little bit. Uh, it's a little. Yeah. Too. It's a great point. It's fascinating. That he's like it's in the middle. Like Watergate is. It, there's already like rumbles. I may have the dates wrong because I believe there's already like rumbles of Watergate, and yet he's like totally like leaning on his inner circle to to like dig up like how what did Nap LaJoy hit in 1887? You know what I mean? Like it's just so, so random. Mm-hmm. And and Nixon had a lot of other ways that he sort of involved himself in sports while he was the presidency, including sort of naming a national championship in 1960 yes. or naming a national champion, I should yeah. say yep. between Texas and Arkansas, which is the famous like, game of the century. It's called one of the college football yep. games of the century. And he sort of um, named, uh, I think it was, I think it was Texas who won the game, right? Yes. And Texas he, won. Yes. 
and he named them champion, much much to the chagrin of Joe Paterno and Penn State, who thought that who they should have been in the defeated. conversation. And you know what's so fascinating about that is, so Nixon goes there at least in part for political reasons, because like the, the, his his political people believe that like the kind of people who go to those college football games are like Nixon people, whatever that meant. Like they they he was there at least for somewhat political reasons. He liked football. But he was not obsessive about football in the same way he was about um, baseball. Uh, uh, funny Richard Nixon thing, hated basketball. Not entirely clear why, but like even from a young age, he didn't like basketball. Anyway, there's a, such a fascinating piece of that story. So as you said, it's Texas versus Arkansas. Bill Clinton is a kid watching that game. And at halftime, Arkansas is ahead and they bring Nixon into the booth. And Nixon, like Nixon's, like, well, I, I don't know. I mean, he's like, I think Texas is going to pull it out. And 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 Clinton, to this day, like remembers that and believes that Nixon jinxed Arkansas <laughs> by picking Texas. I mean, it's it's again, like the amount that people care about sports, even at even presidents, is is remarkable. But yeah, Nixon. I mean. I said before that I think Nixon's fandom was genuine, and, and I think it was. At the same time, every president, Nixon included, understood and understands that it's very hard to get elected to something in this country, particularly president, which is like such a personal vote for people. If you have no idea who LeBron James is, just as an example, mm-hmm. like you have to be culturally conversant. Sports is a language that most people speak. A lot more people speak it than speak the language of politics. And so for a politician, you've got to at least kind of faint at at that, you know, pretend maybe that you've got some interest in it. Uh, most of them had a native interest. I think the two who are the least interested are Lyndon Johnson, who basically just cared about politics, honestly, even though he grew up in like the South during, you know, when football was a big deal, as it still is, and Ronald Reagan. You know, Reagan, Reagan sort of, he had like a passing fancy with Notre Dame football because he had played George Gipp, who, by the way, is like a totally fictional character. But but he had played George Gipp in a movie. And so he kind of identified with Notre Dame football and would occasionally watch it. But like for the most part, he didn't really care. He'd much rather be on the back of a horse. And that's sort of ironic because other than Bush and I guess Trump, depending on how you want to look at it, Reagan was one of the few who had actually worked in sports as a radio announcer Absolutely. for baseball in the 30s. So it was his first it was his first job basically out of out of college. His first job is working doing Cubs games and he's actually in Arizona at Cubs spring training when he gets a call from a Hollywood studio saying, "Will you come and do a screen test?" And he leaves does the screen test and comes back. And then later, you know, they say, we'll pay you X amount of money, which is much more than he's making as a Cubs announcer. But yeah, I think somebody said this to me and I thought it was a great point. I can't remember who it is. Unfortunately, they said the best way to understand Reagan is to think of him. You know, he was a lifeguard as a kid when he's a teenager, he's a lifeguard and he would keep stats on how many people he saved. So later in life, he would say he had saved 70 people on the rock river between you know in seven years or something like that again is that true (laughs) it's very hard to check but somebody said like him as a lifeguard is a great way to think about reagan like he's necessary but removed like that was kind of who he was right he 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 was part of these scenes but always at a remove he was not the guy sunning himself on the beach he was the guy in the lifeguard chair watching out and get jumping in the water if he needed to. And that's kind of how he is his whole life. Like even Nancy Reagan, I quote her in the book. She says like, he never really had any close friends. Like he didn't, he didn't identify in that way, which is such a contrast by the way, to George Herbert Walker Bush, who's super competitive, who loves teams, team sports, who's really into that sort of like that connection that you get from playing team sports. They're running mates, but obviously they, they, you know, Reagan and, and Bush didn't have that great relationship. I think in some ways, cause they were so different in the way that they looked in the world mm-hmm. and it's interesting because sort of the public personas of both of them which is something that bush really tried to shed was that bush was the aloof one sort of yep. the stuffy new englander whereas reagan was able to foster that image as sort of, if you ask people during his, reagan's presidency which one of them is the more passionate sports fan bush totally. or reagan they all would have said reagan even though it wasn't the accurate facts. 
I think one of the most fascinating things from the book is that, you know, in a lot of ways, Bush and sports helps explain this. Bush is deeply misunderstood as a president. Um, you know, like you remember the cover, I think it was Newsweek, the wimp factor, you know, this idea that George Bush is kind of a wimp and, and, and not not tough enough to be president. When in fact, like, again, this is a guy who is like a uh, very serious athlete, very competitive. His mother is like a very competitive and good tennis player and sort of raises him on competition and the need to be the need to sort of uh, behave in a gentlemanly way. But but that competitiveness is good. Uh, he's good at all sorts of different sports, right? He's he's good at horseshoes. He starts a horseshoe league when they're in the White House. <laughs> and Reagan is like not at all interested in any of that stuff. He's like a very mediocre athlete. You know, there are different reports. He plays he plays some football in college, but like he's a very sort of like passing athlete. Not nothing great. And I think that the whole sports thing, Bush was not good at tooting his own horn, at least in part because his mother had raised him to always sort of defer credit talk about the we versus the me through the lens of sports. And I think he's uncomfortable getting out there and being like, I did this, then I did that, then I did that. He's like the anti-Trump in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. He, 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 you know, he can't take credit for things he's actually done, which by the way, I think is a reason that if you look at presidents whose ratings have sort of improved and images have improved since they left the white house, George HW Bush is almost near, always near the top. Yeah. Of that. One of the things that I thought of, and I literally um, I've not had time to think about this question all that much because I just thought of it, you know, five minutes before we started this interview. (laughs) It's interesting to me how many of these guys played football Mm -hmm. as their main sport. And I just kind of jotted down a quick list. Ike Kennedy, Nixon, Reagan, Ford, I guess in some ways, I mean, maybe there wasn't as much out there because there was really only baseball and maybe basketball for some of the leaders. But do you think there's anything to that or do you think it's just sort of a, an accident of history that all these guys, you know, not all, but more seem to have played football and baseball or basketball or yep. even, you know, run track or anything like that? I think so. I think two things. One, I think you're right. There was just less offered. Right. So it, and that was the sport that young men played much more so than basketball, even more so than baseball. Uh, Eisenhower played baseball and was actually pretty good. But but overall, you're, you're right. Um I do think, though, that the and this is especially true for Nixon, who did play football. I put that in air quotes like he was he, he was I should say he was on the team. He, he never really like actually saw the field. He was on the team. Nixon, like very much learns the lessons of sort of strategy, putting one like uh, sequencing, putting one thing after the next thing, after the next thing, after the next thing. He very much learns that from watching football. His coach, this guy named Chief Newman, Native American guy, he Nixon very much identifies with him and his approach to life and the sort of like, it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get up. So I think there's a strategic element to football. It's very episodic uh, that probably played a role. But I do think it is also worth noting that like once you get beyond Nixon and Ford, it starts to fade out. Mm-hmm. Not only do less people play in college, I mean, one of the things that I think is hilarious is, you know, I've just described Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon as very mediocre athletes, both of whom played a college sport. Yeah. Like, you know, Barack <laughs> Obama did not play a college sport. Donald Trump played one year of of, of uh, uh, squash mm-hmm. at Fordham. Uh, Joe Biden did not play a college sport, though he wanted to play the wide receiver at the University of Delaware, but didn't like, you know, most of our modern presidents have not met that bar. Some of that's just like the, the bar for being an athlete, even at the D, low D1, D2, D3 level is much higher. But some of it, I, I think, is just a focus. Like back then, that was a focus. That is what you did. That is how you sort of got to know yourself and the world around you in a way that it's less true now. Yeah, and then you look at somebody like Clinton, who really had no real team sport no. background. No. He was a fan, but didn't really have any sort of team sport background, even in the even in the slightest. Whereas, you know, 30, 40 years later, everybody, it seems like, did something athletic in their school days. Ab- absolutely. And um, I, 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 it's funny. I think of, like, high-end sport uh, involvement, like military service. It used to be that, like, you couldn't get elected to anything in this country if you hadn't served in a war. I mean, mm-hmm. like, yeah. you know, 70% of the House were veterans. And now it's, a, you know, that number is, I don't know the number, but it's way, way lower. It, it feels like it's something that used to be a requirement that no longer is. 
yeah, that, that probably the, the football point may not be totally unrelated because, you know, obviously a lot of the comparisons between football and war and yep. playing, playing football as a young, you know, preparing soldiers, you know, I'm a West Point season ticket holder. That that's still a connection is one they yep. try to make. So I think it probably made you a more attractive candidate in previous that's, generations. Too. I think that's exact. I think that's exactly right. And somebody made that point to me in, in the book, which is it was it, I, the intro of the book. I talk about, I don't go into great detail with this because it was a little bit before the time that I was focused on, but Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt gathers like the big heads of, I think it's Yale and Princeton and one or two other schools at the time who were the powerhouses in football gathers them because football has become so violent. People are dying on the field mm. and, and Roosevelt to your exact point, Roosevelt, directly links playing football to getting people ready to serve in combat. And he thinks that's really important for young American men to do. And that's why he gets these group together to try to quote unquote, save football, which they, they, they sort of do by making it a little bit safer. But yes, I think that's absolutely a thing. One other like very interesting thing I didn't know anything about until I did the book. So obviously Eisenhower's, you know, gigantic military hero before he uh, comes into office he is also a, a bridge playing addict. He mm -hmm. loved bridge. <laughs> um, and there's all these, once you talk about going down a rabbit hole on the internet, try the bridge rabbit hole. You can really go deep. <laughs> so there's, I, I didn't know this before. There's all these articles. Uh, what you were saying made me think of it. There's all these articles about how bridge is being compared to the strategy of, is closer to the strategy of war than any other game out there. And that drew Eisenhower to it for that reason. It's like you have to make decisions that like how much do you let your friends know based on your opinion, your, what you do, how much information you let your friends know. Do you deceive to try to deceive the enemy? Like there's just a lot of – there's a great piece who – now, of course, I can't remember who wrote it. But there's a great piece that ran the Washington Post in like 1990 that basically talks about bridge – and its comparisons to war strategy and why so many high-end military and political leaders were really, really into bridge, which I thought was, again, I mostly tried to stay focused on the purview of like sports, but like, mm -hmm. you know, sports and entertainment and games, I got a little into that with, with Eisenhower. You know, and it's funny that you mentioned that because this is actually, a, might be a future episode that Andrew and I do. And it's something we've talked about in the beginning. When Sports Illustrated was first published, I think in 54 was the first year of Sports Illustrated. If you look at the covers of Sports Illustrated for like the first, let's say, two or three years, mm -hmm. there's, I mean, and, and there's the usual, you know, Casey Stengel, Mickey Mantle, Willie right. Arnold Palmer, Arnold right. Palmer. Yeah. yeah. But then yeah, there's yeah. also squash, a lot of yeah. hunting. Uh, there's a yep. there's an there's a front page of, about, about gourmets, you know, cooking. <laughs> and there's one about it's so cool. And there's one I would about... love to listen to that episode. <laughs> well, we'll we'll let your yeah. we'll let your guys know when yeah. you get that up. That's um, totally that's to right. It, it, yeah. One, one here's here's a super weird fact. We haven't talked that much. We talked a little bit about Nixon, but you know, one thing that Nixon does a lot of is bowl, which is like so prototypical Nixon. Like he had lanes installed in the White House at like ten o'clock at night. By his own admission, he goes into the lanes and just rolls like seven or ten games, like by himself. <laughs> But anyway, fun factoid. Did you know the first athlete sponsored by a company in America is a bowler? It was, was like in the early, late late no. 60s. Was that in the book? Yes. Okay, because I was going to say, I feel like I heard that very recently. I mean, it's, so. just, cra it's, just, it's just crazy to me. Like, it, you know, that's the thing. Like, we think of Nixon bowling and you're like, oh, what a weirdo. Like, he's into this, like, very, you know, minor sport. He's, like, really into it. He, like, tries to brag about it. He's actually pretty good. He tries to brag about how good he is. But, like, at the time, like, bowling was a really big deal. Mm -hmm. The first athlete to make more than a million dollars is a bowler. It's there's some weird there's some weird bowling stuff in there too. Again, that's why I love doing the book. To be totally honest, like there's so much fun stuff that I didn't know anything about. That like I kind of you can go down these rabbit holes and find interesting stuff. And you brought it into so many different places. You know whether it was you know bridge with Eisenhower or you talk about uh, Jimmy Carter and his fishing. And I think his yes. was it G Jimmy Carter's first published. It's not like today when everybody's on Twitter, whether they're a former president or yep. whoever. But Jimmy Carter's sort of first communication with the world, his first public uh, 
public writing was in um, was in a fly fishing magazine in 1982. Totally. He after he loses the first thing that he wrote to your point is like this super. I mean, I read it. It's super. I didn't understand any of it because I don't know anything about <laughs> fly fishing. It's this really nerdy examination of like three days of fly fishing about like what <laughs> lures, what lures he used, and like all this slang in it. And you're like, what the? And one of the things that Carter was the most upset about uh, on leaving the White House was that his like prized rods got lost. I mean, it's just totally fascinating um, uh, about like what he prioritized. I mean, uh, again, like the that that's the thing is like somebody asked me uh, today or yesterday, like, what's it like now that the book is out? And you know, it's it's for me. Like it was so fun to do. I care what people think. I hope people like it. I don't want to be like I could care less. I, I obviously they, care. I, I, I hope, hope they sells. like it and hope they buy it. Right. Right. I hope <laughs> it sells. Um, at the same time, like it was really fun to do, and I think I finished the writing in Labor Day, twenty twenty two. I finished writing it. So the, the this this whole time has been editing, uh, and then like you know the book publishing process takes forever. It's like the it's like the last readout of like slow America. Like there's there's everything takes longer than you think. But I had forgotten. I had forgotten a lot of the stuff that I really loved about the book, you know, because it's, I'm not like going back and reading through the book every day, but I went back and read through it. And it's just, I, I really enjoyed doing it. Like it was fun. It was not, it, it never really felt onerous, which is not to say there weren't days where I was like, God, this is, I have to write more today. Of course, at times, that's what my wife always says. The reason that they pay you to work is, you know, they pay you to work. It's because it's not just something you would do for free. Um, <laughs> But but overall, it's it was just like a really cool for someone who cares about sports and politics a lot. It was like just a really cool opportunity, more than anything. I guess we should probably talk at least a little about golf, seeing as how yes, that's yes. shorthand for every president really since Eisenhower is what yep. do presidents do they golf, yep. um, and that's obviously created. You know, I, I remember kind of distinctly in the Obama years, people. Obviously, people on the other side criticizing how much golf he was playing. But then even people, I think it was Bill Maher or something one time saying, like, I didn't vote for this guy as a golfer. I voted for him as a basketball mm -hmm. player. And like, <laughs> it, it come yeah. with, yeah. you know, not being seen playing too much or being out of yeah. touch, but, you know, using it as so it's, you know, can you talk a little about the yes. different, you know, whose so relationship with golf was the most interesting? So it's the through line through all of them, to your point. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. the, it's the thing that it's the th a lot of them played football. Uh, you know, a, a fair number of them ran. But the thing that all of them did at least a little bit, right? And like LBJ, again, is a little bit of an outlier because he didn't do anything other than politics. But he occasionally golfed. Is they golf. Um, mm -hmm. I think the natural question there is why. And from everyone that I talk to... I got a very similar answer, which is being president is a really nice prison, which is like you can't go anywhere, do anything. You can't go for a run outside. You can't go for a walk outside. You can't go to dinner. You can't like you. Can, there's very little you can do um, that feels, quote unquote, normal. Like and, and I think that's increasingly true in the last 25, 30 years and that on the golf course. Yes, there are still Secret Service. It's not like the Secret Service like just lets you, you know, go <laughs> go golf for six hours. There's Secret Service there, but they're on the fringes of the fairways or they're in the trees, and you can feel like you're outside and you have some level of normalcy happening uh, that you don't get anywhere else. So I think that's what draws them all. I think it's why you see them do it, even though sometimes it is not great optics. Like one fascinating thing, I didn't know this, but I learned in the course of doing the book, the best natural golfer of, of from Eisenhower on is JFK. Like he's like a really good natural golfer. He has back problems, obviously it limits, but like I had, a, I actually talked to a guy at Golf uh, Magazine who broke down all of their swings because they're like, you can, you can find their swings available on like on YouTube. There's some video of all of them swinging and he mm -hmm. broke down their swings. And he said, like, JFK swing is, like, by far the most natural and easy. You can tell he has a back problem, but it's, like, the best. Um, but JFK was very reluctant to ever be seen playing golf or talk about golf because 
he already was like the his dad was an ambassador and a really wealthy guy. His you know his 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 uh, he had he came from a family of like achievers. Uh, he he was widely seen as his dad having bought his place in the house and the senate. So he didn't really talk about it, but he was the best. Uh, the one who had the most interesting relationship with it, I think, is is I'll give you an old and a new. So the old is Eisenhower. In that, I think. For all the criticism of you point out Trump and Obama playing golf, like Eisenhower played 10 times as much golf as either of them. I mean, Eisenhower mm-hmm. played all the time. I mean, he was constantly playing. He was mm-hmm. he was going on like three month vacations from like August to October where he would just play golf 36 holes a day. <laughs> they don't let you do um, that anymore. <laughs> no, that's not a thing anymore. It's, it's very much a 50s thing. This was pre pre internet, pre pre uh, Twitter. But he, I think, along with Arnold Palmer, and there's a bunch of this in the book, he, first of all, he and Palmer are very good friends. They, they become tight. Um, he and Palmer sort of, through golf, sort of teach America what leisure time is for. So if you think about it, we've come out of the war, we've won, the suburbs are suddenly a thing, people have a little extra time, they have a little extra money, no one knows what to do with that time and money. Eisenhower sort of points the way and says, I do this thing. And he did it a lot, to be honest. And and by the way, I don't think Eisenhower played golf because he wanted to like lead the country into a new suburban world. I think he played golf because he liked playing golf. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but I think the, the residual effect was people looked and saw this military hero, the president, he was out doing this. He was active. He was out in, in nature and golf has, has a boom there. So I think that's, he's really important both to the history of golf and, but also to the history of sort of the country becoming the country that we, now know where it's city and suburbs and anchors. Um, the other one is Trump. I mean, I, I just don't think you can talk about golf without talking about Trump. I think it's it's facile to be like, oh, he just cheats all the time. Like the, the truth of the matter is that Donald Trump is a very good golfer. Like anyone who has played with him will tell you, particularly for his age, I think he's 76 or 77 now, but particularly for his age, he's quite good. Now, is he as good as he says he is? No. He he is not a scratch. Mm-hmm. He's not like a one. I think he's probably I think he's probably like a six to eight. Which again, if I could shoot seventy eight to eighty, I would be like thrilled. You know, I mean, and I'm I'm thirty years younger than him. <laughs> um, but his golf experience is different. So he's not a member uh, at Medalist or Augusta or you know any of these really ritzy old money clubs. They will not have him. It's why he starts Trump International Golf Clubs, because he isn't invited to be a member at these places that he covets, like Augusta. You know, think of Donald Trump at Augusta. Like, could you think of a worse fit? Like, just in terms of Augusta's vibe versus Donald Trump's vibe, right? And so part of the reason he gets into these golf courses, which, by the way, now have become a essential piece of his real estate empire is because he's not allowed to be a member at clubs. He wants to be a member at. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that there's, there's a lot there uh, on golf. I mean, a ton, but I think those, for me, those are the two most interesting as it relates to golf, their psyche and sort of what it means for the country. The, I know we got just a few minutes left with Chris Eliza here and thank you so much for being a a guest. Oh my gosh, I'm happy to do it. Um, the, the sort of the flip side to Trump who cheats some and but is good was LBJ who cheated all the time and was terrible. Terrible. And with, uh, with <laughs> LBJ, I, I don't even know that you could call it cheating because I don't think he tried to hide no, no. what he was doing. <laughs> um, he would just kind of he would keep hitting till he found a shot he liked. Um, That's exactly it. There's a great story about LBJ um, not related to sports that I, I um. I've mentioned this a few times in the podcast, but I've, I've taught a class on the Senate in the past and um, how Johnson was a certain way from basically as young as, as you know, yes. he could remember. And there's a story about how they, a, a, um, a, a student, a, a classmate was out at recess crying that somebody had eaten his piece of pie and Johnson's cousin goes into the classroom and sees Johnson with pie all over his face, probably four years old. And the, this, this, the cousin just asked him, why did you do this? And LPJ just looks at him and goes, I wanted a piece of pie. And so that's <laughs> that's sort of like it, the LBJ and that philosophy kind of carries over to golf. It's like, well, why do you just keep hitting? Well, because I, I haven't found a shot that I like yet. So it reminds me of that Simpsons episode where Bart becomes like uh, 
he becomes like the cipher for this like self-help guru. He's like, be like the boy, yep. uh-huh. be like the boy. It's exactly the same. Like I do what I want. Um, yep, exactly. Yes. Uh, that is LBJ to a T. Um, I, and I don't, I, I didn't mean T that way, but yes, that is, that is, that is, that is who he is. I think he's, he's utterly uncaring of the rules of golf, right? And, and utterly uncaring of sort of the etiquette piece of it, the sort of unstated rules. Like he kind of does what he wants when he wants to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's one of the reasons he never really played organized sports. He was not great at following the rules, particularly if he thought the rules disadvantaged him in some way, shape, or form. There's great stories. It's from Robert Carroll's books mm-hmm. that I used in, in, in mine yeah. where like they're out playing and he is like uh, all, all the, he's like eight or something. And the, everyone's out playing. And like, he's like over talking to the men at the corner about politics. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's just a, he's yeah. a strange, he's always was who he was. Mm-hmm. He was a, he was an odd kid in that he was not interested in sports. He showed no interest in playing or watching or spectating or, or being interested in them in any way, shape or form. And was always obsessed from a young age with politics and power and power. So and by the way, by the way, just one other quick LBJ thing, the power thing reminds me of. So when LBJ comes to Washington, he realizes he has to make friends with Richard Russell, who is the Senate Majority Leader guy from Georgia, a bachelor. Russell loves baseball. Russell is like Nixon. He's like obsessed with baseball and the stats. LBJ couldn't give a crap about baseball, about any sport, but about baseball. But he, the, he realizes his way in with Russell is to feign interest in baseball, go with Russell to the baseball games because Russell's got no one to go with and Russell doesn't like going by himself because he's the Senate majority leader. Like it's a little weird to just like go and Mm -hmm. sit at the national senators game by yourself. Um, So LBJ goes with him, fakes that he's interested in it. And that's one way that they build the relationship. But, But that's the way that LBJ saw sports and basically everything, which is like purely transactional. Absolutely. Um, I know we only have a couple minutes left here. Andrew, did you have anything before we closed out? No, I did think it was kind of interesting. You mentioned with uh, with LBJ, with Russell, and then you know Nixon with the Redskins. At some point, yep. there was a switch between the presidents and other high-profile politicians rooting for the D.C. teams to changing to being very open about rooting for the teams. Rooting for their that. home team, yes. And I feel right. like that says something, you know, um, yeah. that about, you know, and I, it probably – the fact that they all go home every weekend, except the president, yeah. obviously there's well, something in there absolutely. where they more see DC now is just a place to conduct their. That's it. I totally, I totally agree. I think that that's, I think that's a thing to where they live. Yeah. yeah. I think that's totally a thing. Um, I think, mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah. one thing that I didn't touch on that I do think is interesting is like Nixon and Ted Williams are like, very are very tight. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Williams is like a noted conservative, you know, like if you talk to conservatives about conservative athletes, they always cite Ted Williams. He loved Nixon and hated JFK, which always bothered JFK because obviously like Ted Williams is so associated with the Red Sox <laughs> when JFK always wanted this endorsement and he and JFK and Ted, Ted Williams would never even meet with JFK. He'd just be like, tell him I'm a Nixon man. But <laughs> 61 is like the best year for both William Williams is managing the senators and wins manager of the year. And Nixon has like a very good first year in office. It all basically goes downhill for both of them after that. But yeah, I do think that there was a sense that, you know, you're from here now, this is where you root. Mm-hmm. This is where you live. And and now it's like very much out of style to root for any Washington team. Cause it shows you've gone Washington in, in some way that I guess mm-hmm. is pejorative. Mm-hmm. And just to put an exclamation point, that same year of, of 69, when Williams comes to manage the Senators, that's also the one and only year that Vince Lombardi uh, is the coach of the Redskins. So just a little. That's right. Little yeah, extra. What a crazy year. Right. Mm-hmm. And yep. honestly, if you go back and look like 69 was Ted Williams best year, certainly as a manager ever. And it's probably Nixon's best year as a president. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they both sort of lived it up. You know, Nixon would go to games and, and you know, root Williams on and write Williams notes. And again, like getting back to sort of where we started, Richard Nixon as like fanboy extraordinaire. So we could not um, we could not recommend the book uh, more highly um, and including one thing we didn't get to, which is that the fact that uh, Jim Nance uh, once played in a golf foursome with uh, two uh, <laughs> presidents in George uh, Bush, 41 and Bill Clinton. <laughs> 
And the fourth uh, member of that foursome was somebody that if you're a listener to this podcast or just a, a citizen of planet Earth, you might have uh, heard of, which is a quarterback by the name of Tom Brady. Um, TB12. <laughs> exactly. Um, Chris <laughs> Eliza, thank you so much. The book is called Power Players, Sports, Politics and the American Presidency. And, and thank you so much for joining us for some time here absolute, today to talk about it. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for you guys doing what you do. Thank glad, you very much. Glad All to right. do it. Take care. All right. Be well. All right. Take care. All right. Well, that was that was fun. Yeah. And the book, I, it'd be hard to come up with a more tailor made book for us specifically and probably for our audience. Maybe there'll be a prequel where we can talk about, you know, if James Madison could hit the curveball. <laughs> all right. Well, this was fun. And uh, we will uh, look forward to uh, having you all join us again down the road. But until then, I'm Dan Newman. And I'm Andrew Newman. Goodbye, old sports. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history. But as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.